This is Enjoy Life Part 5. This is Living, living a Balanced Life Continued <laughs> from last week, for a lack of a better uh, title. I want to I wanna read our main scripture. I'm going to read it out of the New King James this morning, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. It says, Command those who are rich... In this present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on Aeonian Zoe, life in their moment, that they may lay hold of that. And in First and Second Timothy, that terminology is in there a couple of different times, lay hold on something. In other words, you've already got it, so just lay hold of it. And whenever he says to Timothy, you're storing up things, um, you're storing up for yourselves a good foundation for the time to come, he's not talking about your storing up treasures in heaven. He's talking about to Timothy, if you'll walk in the love of God and if you'll stay consistent, even whenever you miss it, even whenever you blow it, if you'll get back on course and do the things that you're supposed to be doing, uh, you're, what you will do is you will help yourself in the days ahead. And again, 70 AD was approaching very, very quickly for them. And I, I want to say this again, <laughs> is that First and Second Timothy was written as personal letters to Timothy. I, I ran four miles last night, uh, about midnight <clears throat> last night, and then I come in and I read through First and Second Timothy again. I, I've done that like three times this week. I've read, I just slowly read through it, and you know, the, I, I'm going to say this again. I don't, even Paul said at the end of Second Timothy that all Scripture, you remember what I said to you a few weeks, all Scripture is given, that word is shouldn't be in there, all Scripture given by God, all Scripture. And he wasn't talking about his letter. He wasn't talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He was talking about the Scriptures that they had out of the Old Testament. They weren't looking at their writings as Scripture. And, and, and the thing was is that I was reading through a couple of things really caught my attention again this week is that, <clears throat> is that Paul um, was dealing with a lot of cultural stuff that I wouldn't deal with. I wouldn't deal with the way he was saying it to Timothy. I wouldn't say it the same way today. I, I, you say, and I remember a, f a few months ago whenever Jake Stringer was here, he made a statement. He said, what would you do if your pastor uh, uh, wrote something and that it was outside the Scriptures? What would you do or what would you say? I can't remember exactly how he said it, but what would you do? What, what, if, what if I dealt with things a little differently than what Paul was telling Timothy to deal with things? I'm telling you that I see a progression even in First and Second Timothy, how many ever years between those two books, three or four or five years, I see a progression even in Paul's thinking and the way that he was talking to Timothy in that moment. So, and Robin and I had this discussion Yesterday is I, I think we do have to be careful whenever we're reading the Scriptures to understand the culture and the moment. Do you know that there's some Scriptures in there that Paul tells slaves uh, to obey their masters? That's what they were dealing with. Now, and, and the, the, the denominational churches used some of those Scriptures to endorse slavery in the United States and the South. Pastor Terry, you're talking about enjoying life. I am talking about enjoying life. So we can't, we got to be careful how we're looking at scriptures. It's okay to debate. It's okay. The early church, 
didn't, they had speakers, I'm absolutely positive of it, but it was more of a give and take, people working around things. They were exploring. They weren't trying to tell everybody this is, I'm, they weren't trying to say this is the way that I'm telling you that it's got to be. Now, as I was at, at one o'clock in the morning, and even this morning during worship, I was just thinking about Paul and what he was coming out of. Paul was pretty direct about some things. He was saying, you need, he was telling Timothy, you need to do what I told you to do. But was that really what, and then, then, he would, then he would morph off, like in 2 Timothy, he would say, but the Lord give you understanding in all things. So he was still coming out of 1,500 years of religious dogma. And I was telling the two Sherry's this morning, standing in the back, <laughs> it's no, we're no different. We're coming out of 1,500 to 2,000 years of religious dogma. Misunderstanding of what even is written. And so sometimes I look at them and I say, oh, poor pitiful them. And I look at me and go, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming out of some thought processes too that's been handed down generation after generation. I read something this morning to Robin, and I, I may not get the whole, hang on, just let me look it up. Give me a second. Somebody say, give him a second. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I thought this was interesting. <clears throat> I remember a story that the reason why train tracks are the width that they are is because that was the width of the horse and buggy carriage wheels. The old tends to birth the new. And the new carries with it all of the earmarks of the old. The reason why we resort to childhood indoctrination is because that is what we know. In other words, if, if we, we will go back to what is familiar to us. We will, in the midst of pressure, in the midst of drama and chaos, we will resort back to what we were indoctrinated with. Oh, you don't know how good that is this morning. You, you will. Now, I'm, can we grow past it? Oh, we can. But the tendency is for us to do that, and that's what she's saying. The reason why we resort to childhood indoctrination is because that is what we know, not necessarily what is true of us. No more than ever, people are leaving religious structures because consciousness is much more sophisticated than what we have been force-fed as children. It is no longer that familiar to us because we as a civilization have grown past the point of our programming. Remember Neo in The Matrix? He took the red pill and went down the rabbit hole. How deep does the rabbit hole go? It goes a lot deeper than we thought. Otherwise, I might have not have tumbled to begin with. Come on. <clears throat> Come on, Terry, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Yes, you would have still tumbled. <laughs> No more than ever, people are leaving religious structures because consciousness is much more sophisticated than what we have been force-fed as children. It is, no longer what, it is no longer that familiar to us because we as a civilization have grown past the point of our programming. No longer do we accept that a loving God would burn people forever. That wasn't God. That was a concept birth within the Inquisition period of time, and that was adopted as a very effective means to control people. Hello. A while back, I heard a man named Ian Chellen say this. Well, I'm not going to read that. That'll, that'll get me off on another thing. Uh, it became very uncomfortable for me, for this person, to attend church 
anywhere that taught similarly that the reason we have train tracks, the width that we do, is because that was the width of the horse and buggy carriage before me. She said, it's time to move on. And to realize what, to realize, the reason why I read that is because we have to realize that what they were coming out of was different than what we're coming out of. It's similar in respects, but I didn't sacrifice a lamb or a goat last Sunday morning. They had been doing that for 1,500 years, thinking that it was pleasing to God and that it was never pleasing to God. I'm not coming out of that aspect. I'm coming out of the belief that I thought God needed animal sacrifices to be okay with me. That He ever needed it. How am I doing so? Am I too serious this morning? Look at somebody and go. Okay, thank you, Phil. Man, I'm glad I got you in my life, Phil. <laughs> Let me give you the definition of enjoy life again. The definition of enjoy life is to take pleasure or satisfaction in the life of the Father within you right now and in every moment. Right now, the life of the Father within you, to enjoy life. Can you enjoy life? Paul was writing this to Timothy, and basically he was telling him to enjoy life in the midst of all the struggles, in the midst of all the things that he was going through. John says, uh, you know, that uh, in this life you will have tribulation and persecution, but be of good cheer. He was, Jesus was saying that, To those people then, I think he would say it to us now, but I think it would be in a different way that he would even say it now to us. Because their struggles weren't our struggles. It's different. But we've got to come back to the place of joy. We've got to get a sense of balance is what I was saying last week. And and I want to continue on with that. Balance is defined as a means of judging or deciding, a counterbalancing weight, force, or influence, mental and emotional steadiness. In other words, you know, a, a, a counterbalance would be you've got all of this stuff going on out here. The counterbalance would be you're in Christ. The counterbalance would be your identity is strong, that it never changes. But you can get your, you can get your focus on the outside or what you do, and lose sight of what or who you've got inside of you. Because that never changes. That, that has never changed one iota. I grew up believing that I was spiritually dead and separated from God. Do you know what that does to your mind? We wonder why we have so much psychosis today. I will tell you why. Is because religion is a thief. It comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I just want to let go of all of it. Somebody say let go. I do. I want to I want to shake free from all the confinement that religion has brought in my life. I don't want to shake free from God. I don't want to shake free from the life of God. I don't want to shake free from Jesus, from the Spirit of God. I want to shake free from all of my religious indoctrinations that have caused me not to live out of the abundant life that I have within me. Man. So, everybody say this with me. I want to live a balanced life. And again, finding balance does not come from giving equal parts to all things, unless, of course, you decide that you want to give a little tiny exhausted bit of yourself to everything and never do anything with real commitment, zest, and intention. Our, our society is busy, it's overcommitted, and busyness is celebrated and encouraged. John, it was so good to sit down with you at lunch and just talk this week. It was so good. I appreciate your friendship and your fellowship. How many of you know it? We need to take time. In order, you need to take time for yourself. 
you need to go out and sit on the back porch and rather than thinking about giving a message on Sunday morning, I'm talking about me since this is me, rather than thinking about giving a message on Sunday morning, you just need to breathe and relax and feel the presence and the life of God. And out of, out of that will come this anyway. Are you listening to me? But I... See, we think that's selfish. You know, Pastor Terry, you need to not play golf. Oh, no, I, I need to play golf. I need to hang out with my grandkids for a little while. Are you listening to me? They give me perspective. They reset my, my what did you call that this morning? No, you said something. I can't remember what you said. But it resets my emotional stability. You said something like that. That's what I heard anyway. It, it resets me. There, there's things that we need to do to reset. And that means letting go of everything and just enjoying the presence of Jesus. That's what Mary and Martha, Martha was concerned about a lot of stuff. And Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. That's, that's like meditation, contemplation. She was hearing the words of Jesus. She, the, the, there was just fellowship. What I see happening in the days ahead is great community in the church. I'm not saying that we won't continue to do this, but I think it will be more about us needing each other on a daily basis and us being in community with one another. Do you know that's how I grew up in Fordham, Missouri? Everybody helped everybody. Everybody was in a small town. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, you can't be that way in a big city like Springfield. Oh, yeah, it can be. We can be connected and in, in, in communion with one another. We can talk about scriptures. Sometimes we may get heated or in a debate about them. Are you listening to me? But that's okay. That's what the early church did. They, they, the book of Acts says that, that we need to be as smart as the Bereans and and study what the apostles or disciples are saying to see if those things be so or not. I don't want you to buy into what I believe and what I think because that's what got us all in trouble. It, that's what kept us from being here today. I, and I'm not dissing Terry Bench. I want to I wanna not diss Terry Bench. But I understand that this, the, in order to enjoy life and enjoy church life, this can't be about what I believe. This, is, this has to do with what you believe and how you believe it. How you're even ingesting what I'm saying this morning. Everybody say, enjoy my life. We're, we're in a different moment. We're in a different time right now. I don't know that I saw coming. I knew something was coming in the early 90s. I knew that, I knew that a shift was really taking place. I just didn't know the shift would be to this great of a level in the moment that we're in. You know, and, and Paul is talking to Timothy about money here. And Paul's not against money. He says, he says just don't put your trust in it. Don't, don't uh, um, it's not what you achieve on your own. It's, it's unreliable at best, and, and can change at a moment's notice. This week, the stock market one day dropped 600 points, and the next day rose 500 points. Why? I can give you my thoughts on that. There's a lot of things that are controlling things beyond what you know and see. So things are unreliable, things in, in the physical world. But this is not unreliable. We've, we were told that it was based on our performance, but it's not unreliable. God's not unreliable. God is faithful, but you know what? You're faithful. First Timothy 6 and verse 6 says this, Now godliness with contentment, these are a few verses before uh, the ones that, were, that we've been reading. Godliness with contentment, and this is where we ended last week. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Everybody say great gain. Great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, sh we shall be content. Now, Paul was talking in their season, but I want to say this. Physically, we brought nothing in. I want to say it again. And I'm going to read the Scriptures this morning, but... Spiritually, 
you brought everything in with you. You, you, yes, physically you didn't bring anything in this world, but spiritually you brought everything in. That is powerful, ladies and gentlemen. And whenever I think godliness and contentment, I looked up a lot of definitions, um, and I, and I want to read. Uh, the de- I read the definition of contentment last week. It is peaceful happiness and satisfaction, gratitude and thankfulness. Contentment, peaceful happiness and satisfied, gratitude, thankful. Now, I want to ask you a question. Now, you don't have to answer it. But how many of you are content? How many of you are really content right now where you're at? I think we can be. I'm just not so sure because of our culture and the definition of success. I think, and I'm not saying that it's not wrong to have success, but I think we push and pull, and we try to do all kinds of things to have success in our moment. And I think there's a better way to get success at this point. I think there's a better way than me striving on the outside to get it. I think there's a way of having success inside of me. It's in there. It was given to me, but it's what I think. It's what I allow myself to be absorbed into. And I believe that the things on the outside will come effortlessly as a result of focusing on the inside. We say, Pastor Jerry, are you telling me I don't have to do anything? I didn't say you had to do anything. I'm saying that what you've got on the inside of you will attract that which you need. Because what you have on the inside of you is eternal truth. Eternal truth. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. Eternal truth will operate and give you what you need on the outside effortlessly without you being full of pressure and turmoil and chaos in order to get it. And right now, our world is full of chaos and turmoil because everybody wants to be on top. Everybody wants to be successful. And we'll do it by stepping on each other to get there. I don't think that God is limited at all within any of us. And I think we can all get to where we want to be without stepping on each other and hurting each other. And I think that's one of the things that Paul was relating to Timothy. As I've been looking through First and Second Timothy again, that makes me want to cry out of happiness. This is the word godliness. It says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. And I, again, I looked up a number of things. How many of you know what piety means? Okay, nobody. Um, <clears throat> godliness is piety. Let me give you my thought of this, a belief or point of view that is accepted with unthinking, conventional reference. Let me keep going. It is recognizing, this is my part of the definition, it is recognizing everything is linked to the present presence of God, to love in every moment, waking up to who you are in your moment. Now, that is applicable to Timothy, and that is applicable to you and I. Let me read it again. Uh, Piety, a belief or point of view that is accepted with unthinking, conventional reverence. I'm going to tell you, I am not going to not think. I was told for a long time to think, not think. And that's what we call godliness. I don't think it is... It is an unthinking thing. I think it's coming to a place of waking up, of recognizing. And 
Paul said godliness with contentment, actually this type of thought process, recognizing everything is linked to the presence of God, to love in every moment, waking up to who you are in your moment, will bring peaceful happiness, satisfaction, gratitude, and thankfulness. Let me just say this, physical wealth and success is not the proof that God has blessed your life. You may have to think about that. True contentment comes from realizing that you were born from above with everything that you need to enjoy life in your moment. We did not come into this world with any of our physical stuff any of our physical things that we give our energy and time to striving for, but we did come into this world with everything that we need. We have been given everything that pertains unto life and godliness. Second Peter chapter 1 says this, Jesus has the power of God by which He has given us everything we need to live and serve God. We have these things because we know Him, Jesus called us by His glory and His goodness. And He did that before the foundations of the world. To find a balance, we have to avoid the trap of thinking that more things, more money, more commitments, more everything is always better. Sometimes less is better. I think that's what Paul was telling Timothy, just be glad that you've got food and clothing. And then I, I want to I read this uh, out of the Message Bible. This is what the Message Bible says with, with this. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Brought nothing into this world and is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing with these we, these, we shall be content. Matthew 6 says out of the Message, If God gives such atten- attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think He'll attend to you? Take pride in you. Do His best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way He works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how He works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out on something. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been worked up over something that, that you thought was happening next week? And then you got to next week and it never even happened. And there you spent all of that emotional energy on figuring out what you were going to do or what you were going to say or how it was going to go, and you could have saved yourself a lot of heartache, a lot of emotional turmoil by not even thinking about it. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Are you listening to me? To find balance, we have to, I'm going to say it again, to find balance, we have to avoid the trap of thinking that more things, more money, more commitments, more everything is always better. We have to decide what it is that matters most to us and what is deserving of our time, our energy, and even our money, and then arrange our lives accordingly and be willing to be flexible. Look at somebody and say, I am a a flexible person an adaptable person. In the days ahead, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right up front right now, we've had to be flexible and adaptable in the past. I'm telling you, you're going to have to be flexible and adaptable in the love of God in the days ahead. 
So right now, I'm becoming flexible and adaptable. I'm working on it. Everybody say he's working on it. I believe that we can even make decisions from a healthy place on what outward things are important to give you your time in your life to look inward. I think a lot of times most of us don't get quiet because whenever we do get quiet, we don't like how we feel. But we got to get quiet to change how we feel, first of all about ourselves and then about others. I believe, I really, I believe it begins with what Paul was telling Timothy is that, and what Paul said a number of times, it's about changing your identity that you have towards God, that you're believing that God is good. That changing that begins to change who you are. And then it, it begins to morph into uh, something healthy. How many of you are one with the Father? How many of you have always been one with the Father? How many of you have believed that you've always been one with the Father? Oh, there we go. Now I have, I have no hands. Not always believed that I was. I, I believed I was one with the Father after I said a little prayer. Or baptized, yeah. But I've always been one with the Father, so have you. And that is the real place of peace and contentment. Are you listening to me? That is the place where we begin to recognize that everything is linked to the presence of God, to love in this very moment, and that begins to change things. Robin and I talked about this quite a bit. You can do all that's in your heart to do just not all at the same time. And there's seasons of things. And that means that, that there's certain aspects of things. In, in my previous season, I may have to let go of that in order to be able to do something in my present season. But I'm so comfortable with what I did that it's hard to not kind of hang on to that while I'm moving into another season. But the best thing that I can do is let go of that. I think it's Ecclesiastes that says uh, there's nothing new under the sun and that, that there is a time and a season for everything. You just can't do everything at the same time. But I, can, I believe you can, I, I believe that you can do what you need to do in your season right now. And balance comes from recognizing the season of life that you are in right now. Everybody say recognizing. I can't determine that for you. You and your loving Father have to determine what season you're in and where your focus should be in this present moment. Everybody say present moment. I'm going to go back to uh, Timothy here in a minute and finish reading the passage uh, in verses 6 through 12. But before I do... I know that a lot of us are feeling pressured to do more and more. And I, I see a lot of us that are stressed out, out of balance, and sometimes we don't do anything well. What if you did one thing well? Well, you say, Pastor, is that putting all your eggs in one basket? I don't know. You're going to have to determine that. My uncle told me whenever I was 20 years old, Uncle Wendell, he told me, he said, um, he said, uh, do something with all of your heart and do it, do it to the point where you would do it for free, but because you're going to zero in on one thing, that people will want to pay you to do what you're doing. Hello? But there's a joy and a motivation that comes out of your heart whenever you're doing what you want to do. Let me look all up in the eye. Are you doing what you want to do? I'm just asking. 
we say, Pastor Terry, if I did what I wanted to do, then maybe you should. Maybe there should be some changes. Well, Pastor Terry, I've always dreamed about uh, going and, and to the Fiji Islands and living there. I, I don't know. Please take me with you. <laughs> but see, we put off things to some distant season when we should be doing that right now. That's in our heart. We love it. We want to do it. Man, I feel this really sinking in this morning. What season are you in? What do you want to do? See, I was told, Davey, I heard these messages so many times, I, I can quote them in my own head. They're there in my memories. You know, that whenever you come to Christ, if you're a musician, then if you come to Christ, God will set you down for 10 years and not let you do what you enjoy until you can get a hold of some things. My thought is, play all the way through. That's what you enjoy, so do it. See, we're talking about enjoying life. People aren't doing what they're enjoying, and that's why the, all this pressure is on them. That's why all this chaos and torment and just do what you want to do. And you say, Pastor Terry, can I trust that? What's your favorite scripture? Proverbs. Come on. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident in the Lord, and He will bring it to pass. And he will give you the desires of your heart. There you go. I think God puts the desires in you. They've always been in you to do something special. You don't have to do what I do. You just do you. You understand what I'm saying? You, you don't have to be Terry Bench. I, I, thank God there's only one of me. I'm serious. Can you imagine everybody being a firefighter? Bro. It wasn't meant for everybody to be a firefighter. Only you could do that. Well, and a few others. You understand what I'm saying? Enjoy life. Do what you want to do right now. You know there's a lot of us, and, and I know that you guys that are older, you don't have this mentality. I'm sure you don't. Is that, you know, whenever I retire... Whenever I retire, then I'm going to do this. I'm just saying, there's a lot of people that didn't make it to retirement. My grandfather, a great example. Do you know that this was the week 40 years ago that Bill Turner died? 40 years ago, next Sunday, will be 40 years of ministry for Terry Bench. It's the, the Sunday after he passed away was the Sunday I went up front and gave, it was an emotional thing. I had no idea what the crap I was doing. <laughs> Let's just be honest. But I was emotionally moved by my grandfather dying. And then I went to Bible school. And I began to seek and search. And my whole deal was, I still remember our pastor throwing his arms around me whenever I walked in. I was cutting hair at the barber shop in Springfield. And dad called me and said, your grandpa died. And I, I, I know that I drew, drove from Springfield uh, on Grand and Grand Street there all the way to Fordland to where uh, Ellen and Bill lived. But I, I don't remember it because I was weeping and sobbing. I was emotionally moved in that moment. It, it really did something to me for him to die. And my pastor put his arms around me and he said, Son, we don't know why God does these things. God needed him in heaven more than you did. I threw his arms off. He's really, it's probably a good thing I was such a gentle natured person. Otherwise, I might have hit him right in the face. You don't say that to a 19-year-old, 20-year-old kid that just lost his papa. And my journey began. 
my journey began that I believed that God was good. I didn't know how good He was, but I knew that He was better than what that was. Because God didn't need another flower in heaven. I needed Him here. And a journey began to see how good God is. It's never stopped. I guess my whole point of living a balanced life this morning is in order to really enjoy life, we're going to have to come into a place where we're enjoying what we're doing. That might mean some transformation. That might mean some changes need to take place. But I'm not going to wait until I'm I'm 60 years old. I just turned 60. Gramps retired, I believe, at about 65. And he was dead in three years. He always said that he would lay down one night and, and be on the other side with Jesus. He laid down one night and on July the 31st, somewhere around there, end of July, 1st of August, and he went on to be with the Lord. But I don't want to put off what I'm feeling in my heart to do right now till I'm 68 or 72, because what if I don't make it there? And I think a lot of destructive things happen to us Physically, like my grandfather, whenever we're, not, we're, whenever we're not walking in our purpose, whenever we're not walking in the fulfillment of the desires of our heart. God has put desires in your heart in this moment for you to walk them out. And look at somebody and say, don't be afraid. God has not given me a spirit of fear. That's what he's telling Timothy. God hadn't given you a spirit of fear, Timothy. I know you're pastor in a church of 100,000 people. Just chill out. Don't run. (laughs) Hang on. But it's evident that Timothy was doing what he was wanting to do at that moment. He was fulfilling desires. But we can't go back to Timothy. I'm talking about you today. What's in your heart? What do you want to do? See, that's why we don't have a, a bunch of programs at Turning Point Church. Because this isn't about you fulfilling my vision or my desire. My, my job is to help you fulfill yours. That's, the call, that's one of the call, calls on my life, is to help you fulfill what you want to do. Well, Pastor Sherry, I thought all preachers wanted to build big churches. We do. Because big, big churches means that there's lots of people in there. But I'm not so concerned about the big churches, I, I, about a big church. What I, I, I said it last week. I want to build big people. I want you to fulfill the desires of your heart. Davy went in the uh, forged in fire. That's awesome. I think everybody ought to go on forged in fire. No, no, no. <laughs> you, we, you wouldn't want to see my knife. <laughs> Do what is in your heart. See, David, you did what was in your heart. And look, it turned out really great. Even if you hadn't won, it would have still been a great experience. It would have been your desire to do that. I'm just saying, don't put off today, this next week. And see, this goes into all kinds of things. Sometimes, sometimes I have on my heart uh, to do something. I had on my heart, John lets you and I go eat lunch. So we made time to go to Schlotzky's, and they make really good sandwiches. And we ate at Schlotzky's and and had some fellowship and talked about the Word and encouraged one another. And there's times where, well, you know, know, I I feel like I need to say something to so-and-so. I'll I'll let pastor do it. No. No. If something, if there's a desire in your heart, somebody's name comes up to you, call them, text them, say, hey, what are you doing? See, that's community. That, that changes the dynamics of things. We can't all be 
everything to everybody, but we can be who we need to be to the people around us this next week. Actually, I'm not going to go back to uh, uh, 1 Timothy 6. I want to... I, I want to make a couple of statements as I end. When we're focusing inward, finding our value and worth from what our Papa says about us, then we will begin to walk in a place of balance and contentment. We'll be able to say no to the things we need to without fear. Because we're not looking to the outward things we're doing for our identity and value. Let me, let me, everybody say this with me. Say this with me. No. no. See, that's a complete sentence. Uh, let's, let's try that again. I, I think it'll feel better once you say it two or three times. No. no. See, that's a complete sentence. <laughs> Somebody said no. Everybody say no. There's a lot of things that we need to say no to so that we can say yes to the desires of our hearts so that we can enjoy life at another level. And if you're, listen, if Robin is enjoying life in our marriage, then our marriage is better. If I'm enjoying life, then Robin has a better husband. Now, I'm preaching really good this morning. I'm, make, I'm really making you think today. Everybody say no. no. See, the only reason why I wouldn't say no is because my identity or my worth is tied in to pleasing somebody by saying yes. Now, sometimes I say yes just to help somebody. And you've got to make that determination. But I'm learning to say no a little bit more all the time. Everybody say no. no. <laughs> we will be able to say no to the things we need to without fear because we are not looking to the outward things we are doing for our identity and value. From this place, we can give to those around us from a healthy perspective of letting our Papa define us. We can love without condition and have health, b- healthy boundaries because we're not looking to others or things that we do, the things that we do, we're not looking to others or the things that we do to bring us value and worth. Everybody say value and worth. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm going to read Colossians again uh, as we end, as I ended last week. There's been times that I felt bad for not knowing how to do something. Raymond, if you called me on the phone this week and said, Hey, Pastor Terry, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to build a room on my house. Uh, Would you come over and uh, help navigate building a room? Raymond, I would look at you and say, Let's go play golf. (laughs) You wouldn't want me to build a room. Now, I'm not saying I couldn't do it. That's not my... That's not my desire. I love cars, but cars aren't my desire. Now, I may come over and say, well, Raymond, I'd help you, but I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) Or cars. You know, my dad can probably put a, well, I don't know if you can do it now on the new ones, but he used to be able to take my little Nova 67 Chevy apart and put it back together. He, I mean, that was just his deal. That was, he liked doing that, but didn't you like doing that? Kind of, sometimes. <laughs> well, he did it anyway. He knew how to do that stuff. Say no to that which is not a part of what you really need to be doing. I'm, I'm really trying to minister to you today because I want you to enjoy life. Sometimes you just have to say no. Sometimes I have too much on my plate. And I just have to say, it stops today. No. Can I use you as an example? 
No. Okay, I won't. No, about, about work. Okay, all right. See, I ask. Did I get a brownie point for asking? <laughs> okay, thank you. There, <laughs> I didn't look. I didn't look, Raymond. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, could you go your whole life and never do what you really want to do? Yeah, Davy. I don't want to look back on my life. I, I read a list of 10 things of people that were in their 80s looking back on life. And I read this whole thing, and they gave 10 things about what they wished that they would have done. And uh, one of the top things was I would have ate a lot more ice cream. Yes, that was one of the ten items. I can't remember where it fell, but it was in the... You know, I would have ate a lot more ice cream. You know, I, I would have enjoyed life a little bit more. I think the church institution has caused people not to enjoy their life. And I hate to say that I am... I love the church. I love God's people. I, God's people are every people. You understand what I'm saying? You're here in your pastor's heart this morning. The pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. I don't want us to just go through the emotions, uh, through the motions, and emotionless. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people attend church and are just emotion. We're so bogged down that by the time we even get to church, it's it's like, okay, I'm resting for a second here. And what did you say, Pastor? My job, Robin's job as pastors of, of this body is to, is to help you fulfill what it is that you want to do. And maybe all that will be is giving you an encouraging message to help you get going in that direction. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, how old do you have to be? I don't know. Randy and I jumped out of an airplane because we wanted to a few years ago. I think we need to do it again with the parachutes attached. Yeah. Why don't you guys stand up with me? Well, Pastor Terry, I would never jump out of a good airplane. But Randy and I would. <laughs> Are you all okay this morning? I wasn't too serious, was I? I felt like I was a little serious, but I, okay. Everybody okay? Look at me and say, I am healed from the tips of my toes to the top of my head. I came here whole. And I'm recognizing my wholeness. And I'm recognizing my wholeness. Everything, else Everything else has just been an illusion. Been an illusion. See yourselves co-raised with Christ. Now ponder with persuasion the consequence of your co-inclusion in Him. Relocate yourselves mentally. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities where you are co-seated with Christ in the executive order of God's right hand, His place of influence. Becoming affectionately acquainted with throne room thoughts will keep you from being distracted, distracted again by the earthly realm. Your union with His death broke the association with this world. See yourselves located in a fortress where your life is hidden with Christ and God. The unveiling of Christ as defining our lives immediately implies what is evident in Him he is equally mirrored in you. The exact life on exhibit in Christ is now repeated in us. We are included in the same bliss and joined oneness with Him just as His life reveals you, your life reveals Him. And I wrote something on Facebook this week. I think Papa is proud of you, and he's waiting to see what you're going to do next. He's waiting to see what you're going to do next. I will never forget the morning that I woke up, because I wake up saying, I, I don't know anything to Lord today. Teach me something. And, and I also say, uh, you know, to the Lord, after I say that, 
almost every morning I, I say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? And I remember the morning. Maybe you remember me saying it here a few years ago. I remember the morning that God, I got up and I said that. And I heard the Spirit of God say, well, it's not about what I want to do. What do you want to do? He said, I'll go with you wherever you want to go and do whatever you want to do. Wow. And that's then we jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> God jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> Father, I just thank you for an incredible moment today. And Father, I thank you that, that we caught something this morning, not just yeah. theology, but that we caught something this morning that will help us navigate in the days ahead, that will help us live life at a far greater level, enjoying people and enjoying all of the things that are going on around us. And Father, we're going to finish our course with joy, whatever that course looks like and however long it lasts. Father, we're going to enjoy our lives and our moment in you. That's why you put us here, and we thank you for that. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great week.